Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, reading from the NIV, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against the authorities and against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, because of what I just said, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, Look at somebody and say, it's coming. You may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Let's stop there this morning. I want to talk about the naked truth. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord, the naked truth. The truth of the matter is, is that too many Christians leave home every day without their spiritual clothing. I call it the naked truth. I mean, how do we expect to fight off the enemy? If we leave home half-dressed, how do we expect to fight off the enemy if we walk around half-clad? So the Apostle Paul warns us today that we should, in verse 11, put on the whole armor of God. Why, Paul? He says, so that you can take your stand against the schemes of the devil. We got to be able to stand against the schemes and the strategies of the enemy. Matter of fact, when we studied that a few weeks ago, we said that schemes comes from the Greek, which means deception. That aspect of the enemy that puts forth those deceptive strategies, they look one way, but they're really something else. Because, you see, he has no real power. Satan only has delegated power. It's temporary power. But he is the master of deception. You know, the saddest words I hear often when I'm counseling individuals is that, hear the words, I never saw it coming. You ever heard people say that? Maybe you've said it, I never saw it coming. A spouse leaves unexpectedly. A friend leads you down a destructive path. A relationship you knew was unhealthy, but you kept saying, I'm going to change or I'm going to try. We chase glitter that we find out is really not gold. And we meet folk on Facebook. The next thing you know, they are in your pocketbook. I, I just never knew. Satan knows how to deceive you. You think it's a friendship, and really someone is trying to move you into a courtship. The deception of the enemy. You see, Jesus called Satan the father of lies. He's the mother load of lies. I mean, that's all he is. That's all he does. And Paul said in order to be ready to fight these multifaceted and multiplicities of deceptions, we need to be fully, somebody shout fully, we need to be fully dressed. See, without your spiritual clothing depicted by the Apostle Paul, you really are spiritually naked. That's the naked truth. When you get up and you forget to pray and ask God to, to help you put on your armor because you're so busy trying to get to the office or you're so busy trying to make the next appointment, you find yourselves in a place where you are walking around 
naked and exposed to the tactical strategies of the enemy. So Paul writes this letter to the Ephesian church from them all, from them all places, a jail cell. I mean, Paul has been used by God in the midst of this jail cell. Paul did not let his physical condition hamper his spiritual intuition. Matter of fact, your spiritual intuition ought to be enhanced or enlightened as a result of some of the conditions that we find ourselves in. While going through his demonic attack for being locked up because he's only preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, Paul gets a revelation of a powerful sermon illustration about spiritual preparation even in the midst of his incarceration. Isn't that amazing? In the midst of his, can I back it up and go the other way? In the midst of his incarceration, he sees some spiritual preparation and he puts it in a sermon illustration so that we can understand that if we're going to stay moving forward in spiritual mobilization, we've got to get dressed. Touch them two people and say, get dressed. Come on, tell them. Uh-huh. How many know that God will show you stuff even when you are going through a storm? See, many of us, we close our eyes to what God is doing in the midst of the darkness, but we need to open our eyes because I, I heard Isaiah say, in Isaiah around 45, he said that there are treasures in our darkness. There's some stuff God wants to hand to us even as we go through those dark moments in our lives. So let us not curse the darkness. Let us enhance and grab hold of the things that God may be trying to show us in the midst of the darkness, in the midst of that depression, in the midst of that struggle. And that's what Paul is doing here. Paul is in jail. He's locked up for no reason other than preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he has this revelation from the Holy Spirit because he stayed open to the move of God even though he was in a cold, rat-infested prison. He noticed how well-dressed the Roman soldiers were that were guarding the prison. He noticed that they were so well-dressed that no other army could defeat them. They understood something about battle apparel. And so in his spiritual imagination, he wrote down this metaphorical illustration of how every believer should get dressed for battle every day. When I was a little boy, I remember watching Superman. Anybody remember Superman? <laughs> oh, yes. The major character in the story was Clark Kent. And Clark Kent worked as a newspaper reporter by day, but a superhero by night. And, and though Clark Kent was dressed in earthly clothes, he was really from another planet called Krypton. Somebody going to get that in a minute. I say, though he was dressed in earthly clothes, he was hanging out in a strange land. Yeah, and I noticed one thing about Clark. Whenever Lois Lane or somebody got in trouble, he would find a phone booth. Uh-huh, so that he could what? Change clothes. And when he changed clothes, he was a different man. He was faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, and able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. He became Superman all because he changed clothes. But even though he was faster than a speeding bullet and more powerful than a locomotive and able to leap tall buildings in a single bound, Clark Kent did not become Superman until he put on the right clothes, until he got dressed. And how do you expect to be able to fight the super power of the enemy if you don't change clothes and put on God's clothes every morning? Here's the naked truth. The armor that Paul describes here in chapter 6 are spiritual garments. Listen, remember, we're fighting a spiritual war. And so what I'm doing and what we're doing and what Paul is doing in the Word, he's trying to equip us and ready us for this battle. And we can't fight this battle with physical apparatus. We, like, we must understand that all of this apparatus that the Apostle Paul introduces to us in Ephesians 6, they are spiritual in nature. 
in nature. We, we see, we hear, we smell, we touch, and we taste the things in the physical realm, but they emanate most times in the spiritual realm. See, that's the fruit, that, that smelling and that tasting and the things that we sense. That's the fruit of what's really happening all around us in the spiritual realm. Remember, remember, Paul said earlier that our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against what? Spiritual powers. And therefore, our weapons must be spiritual. I want you to get that in your spirit. You can't curse somebody out and make them leave you alone. You got to pray for them. You, listen, you got to get some spiritual stuff in you. And I know your flesh wants to swing out or, 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 or go, go after them and with your words or with your hands. Or, and, but you got to understand, you've got to learn how to let God equip you with those spiritual weapons. Yeah, so Paul teaches that if you want to live in victory, you have to dress for victory. Yeah, we call it dressing for success. And, but if you're going to listen, if you're going to be successful in fighting the things of Satan, you've got to dress for success. Put on the whole armor of God. Put on the whole armor of God. Put on the full armor of God. The naked truth is you must put on all of God's armor to be effectively in fighting against sin and Satan. And watch this. Look at this. Look at it closely. Put on the whole armor of God. This battle gear is not our armor. You, you can't go buy this at Means Warehouse or at Macy's or Dillard's. No, you, listen, this is God's armor. It's God's armor. So what exactly is Paul saying as he has this spiritual revelation in the midst of his incarceration as he watched the changing of the guard of his jail cell. Paul says, if you're going to be successful in fighting the enemy, you got to get fully dressed. He says that this is the first apparatus you ought to put on. Here it is in verse 14. He says, stand firm, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. So the first piece of apparatus I'm glad Paul mentions he says everything is predicated on truth. Matter of fact, the belt of truth was so central uh, in the location of the armor that all the other armor hooked onto it. See, everything hinges on the truth. I think the scripture says that when you know the truth, the truth will what? Set you free. And in our culture today, there are a lot of uh, falsehoods and a lot of lies that people are treating as the truth. But you got to understand, as God's children, we must put around our belt, put around our waist, the belt of truth. Amen. The belt of truth protected the soft tissue area of the soldier. Yeah, the soft tissue area, the area that the sword can pierce easily, the stomach area. Paul knew that if we were going to live victorious lives, we need to be careful of what we take into our systems. We can't let just anything penetrate our systems. And we can't just digest anything into our systems. Come on, so we got to protect what we put in us because what's in us will come out of us. Huh? When you swallow a lie, you speak a lie. When you swallow an untruth, you live that untruth. Paul said, put on the belt of truth, so the belt will protect your vulnerable parts. I asked the question, what are you putting in your system that the belt of truth is not protecting? The truth holds it all together. See, the devil does not want you to walk in truth. He wants you to walk in deception. He wants you to be a fake Christian. He wants you to be a Sunday phone booth Christian. Put on your super gear on Sunday, but act a fool on Monday through Saturday. That, that's, that's what he wants you to do. He wants you to look holy, but not live holy. He wants you to sing it, but not live it. 
He wants you to talk it, but he doesn't want you to walk it. But when you got on the belt of truth, then you are walking in truth. He's liked to send falsehoods into our system. I can hear him now and saying, oh, there are so many ways to get to heaven. Jesus is not the only way. Go ahead, do it. Life is short. Oh, mom and dad are old fogey. Times have changed. Go ahead, get high one time. One time won't hurt you. Inbox her. Nobody else will know. That's why we need to wear the belt of truth. See, how many of y'all get, get, get a little uh, perturbed when you see these young boys walking around in the neighborhood with their pants hanging down around their knees as if somebody want to see their dirty drawers. I mean, how many? Don't you want to walk and say, man, I don't want to see your drawers. I'm getting real. I know I'm a little, this is a little crass, but, but who wants to see your? Don't you want to just get, put a belt around them and say, man, put your belt on? The problem with us is that some of us are spiritually sagging. Uh-huh, Barreto, that's what's happened. Some of us are, we, see, we're spiritually sagging. We, we, we're showing some stuff that God never intended for us to show in public. Oh, I wish I had somebody shout hallelujah. Look at somebody and say, put your belt on. Spiritually sagging. You wonder why. Come on, somebody. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Amen. So when you see folks spiritually sagging, say, you need to put your belt on. We don't walk up in here like that. But the belt of truth that holds up in everything. Amen? So put your belts on every morning. Don't be walking around work sagging. And letting it all hang out. Then he said, then he said this. He says, and put on, verse 14, the breastplate of righteousness. So Paul said, there's a second piece of apparatus I need you to put on. It's the breastplate of righteousness. God is looking for some righteous folk. See, righteousness is a gift from God. Righteousness is a gift from God. Paul says, before you leave home, Put on your breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness means to live and walk in the ways of God. Well, Pastor, what does that really mean? That means to line up your beliefs, your thoughts, your attitudes, and your behaviors after God's ways. I'm going to say that again. Righteousness means to live and walk in the ways of God, not the culture. Not the popular thing to do, but walking in the ways of God, thinking like God, acting like God, behaving like God. This piece of armor is critical to the believer because the scriptures teach that only the righteous will see God. Only the righteous will see God. Because we learn in scripture that our own righteousness is as filthy rags in the eyes of God. We can't stand before a righteous God on our own account. We have to be imputed the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Somebody shout imputed. Let me give you an illustration of what imputed means. The other day, I, my computer had a virus. And you know, if you let a virus stay around too long, it would eventually destroy your hard drive. Well, I called Kendra, our new administrative assistant, and I said, Kendra, pastor's computer has an antivirus. I mean, has a virus. And she said, well, you need some antivirus software. So Kendra, a man, uh, came and put on my hard drive a antivirus software. 
In other words, she imputed some software on my hard drive to run off my virus. I would have had a virus if I had not got some antivirus software. When Jesus died on Calvary, literally, he became antivirus software. And anywhere there's sin on our hard lives, Jesus' blood and righteousness being imputed to Clarence and unto you, wiped away every virus. I wish I had somebody shout, now you have been imputed righteousness. I came across a powerful scripture, and I'm going to see if we can put it on the big screen for you. It's Zechariah chapter 3. Zechariah chapter 3. I, I want you to, it's, it's the NIV, Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1. This is the beautiful scripture of what it means uh, to be imputed the righteousness of God. Amen. This is what it says. Then, Zechariah 3, verse 1. Then he showed me Joshua, the preacher man, the pastor, standing before the angel of the Lord. Watch this. And Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. So Joshua is standing before God, and to his right is the devil ready to expose every mistake Joshua had done. The Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, devil. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebukes you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? Somebody should have shouted on that. In other words, he was on fire, on his way to death. He, he was in bad shape. Joshua was on fire because his sin had consumed him. And, and, and God said, is it not enough that he was snatched from the fire? Uh, now Joshua, hear this, why was, he, why was he on fire? Verse 3, now Joshua was dressed in dirty clothes as he stood before the angel. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, take off his dirty clothes. That's what God is saying to somebody right now. Take off your dirty clothes. I want to give you some new clothes. I want to dress you like you've never been dressed before. I wish I had five people that at one time in your life, you walked around in dirty clothes. You were so close to fire, you smelled like smoke. But the God of mercy and the God of grace snatched you from the fire. Matter of fact, you were on fire and the Holy Ghost had to on you to put the fire out. Check somebody say, he changed my clothes. He put righteousness, hallelujah, on top of me. When I should have been dead, he redressed me and gave me another chance. How many knows what the blood would do? The blood of Christ will clean up stuff, eradicate stuff. Just like an antivirus cleans your hard drive. God sent his son to be our antivirus software because you were infected. I don't care if you were a Mac or a PC. You were infected. And if, if you have not allowed the antivirus blood of Jesus to be administered to your hard drive, you are in trouble. Amen. The purpose of the, of the breastplate is to protect the heart and the lungs. See, the heart is where the soul hangs out. The lungs is where the breath of God comes forth in your life. 
And so the breastplate of righteousness protects those vital parts. For the, for what, what, listen, for the belt of truth protected the, the soft tissue around your stomach area. Amen. So, so Paul said, now put on the breastplate of righteousness so you can protect your heart and your lungs. So you can breathe in the midst of a storm. See, many leaders fall, even in the church. Spouses and young minds with great potential fall because they forget to daily put on the breastplate of righteousness. And so the enemy shoots an arrow and it penetrates your heart and your lung, causing you to fall. Unrighteousness unlocks the door and Satan then lets all his demons in to establish a stronghold. That's what happens. See, he sends an arrow, it penetrates your heart, and then here come his demons coming into your life to establish a stronghold. Could be a chemical stronghold or a sexual stronghold or a debt stronghold or a food stronghold or some emotional stronghold. And the only way to keep satanic strongholds out of your life is to wear the breastplate of righteousness every day. Somebody shout every day. Because Satan wants to penetrate your heart where your soul is. And he wants to take the breath of the Holy Spirit out of you. You got to get dressed. You got to get dressed. And you got to walk in righteousness. Well, the bed of truth around the vulnerable part of your middle section, Paul says, please put it on. Because the breastplate of righteousness fits into the belt of truth. Matter of fact, when the soldiers run into battle, he tucks in his girdle into his belt of truth so he can run, see, so he won't trip in the battle. And the breastplate of righteousness, you notice it's for the front protection. Because in this battle, you should never turn around and go back. You keep going forward. Then he says, in verse 15, here's the third piece of apparatus, and I close with this one. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You've probably heard of the movie Forrest Gump. In 1994, it was in a blockbuster movie. It won Academy Awards. The film captivated audience all over the world. Tom Hanks played a fascinating character by the name of Forrest Gump. And you remember several scenes of Forrest Gump sitting on the bench with the nurse. And on one occasion, Forrest Gump began a conversation with the nurse after staring at her comfortable shoes. Forrest Gump said, my mama always said, you can tell a lot about a person by looking at their shoes. Mama said, you can tell where they're going and where they've been. You can tell a lot about a person by looking at their shoes. Because you can tell where they're going and you can tell where they have been. How many know you can't do too much when your feet are hurting? Uh-huh. Yeah, that's why we go home and take off church shoes and put on some comfortable shoes. Amen. Because we can't, amen, do too much when our feet are hurting. Matter of fact, the, the popular song back in the 70s by Bootsy Collins, I love it. He says, feet don't fail me now. Uh-huh. Y'all remember that song, Feet? Don't fail me now. In other words, you got to have your feet shod, surrounded by the preparation of peace. Oh, you can tell where a person's been and where a person is going by how much peace they walk around in their lives. Amen. The Apostle Paul observed that the soldier's shoes was a critical part of his armor. Paul noticed that the sandals of the soldiers were different than any other shoe of any other army of any other nation. 
First, he noticed that the soldiers' shoes in the Roman army had laces that wrapped all the way up to the knee. Amen. So the, 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 the Roman soldier wanted to make sure that they had control of the shoelaces and that they would not become untangled in the midst of the battle. The second thing, the, amen, that, 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 that Paul noticed was that, uh, that the, 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 the soldier's shoes had little cleats on those sandals. No other sandal had cleats on them. Because, see, the, the Roman soldier understood, if I don't get good footing, if I don't get some traction, I won't be able to walk around in the peace of God because the devil is always trying to push me to the slippery slope where I don't have no peace. I wish I had somebody to know what it's like not to be able to sleep at night. Huh? How many know the first thing that the north did to the south were to steal their shoes? Because you can't fight a battle if you don't have shoes or if your shoes are inadequate when it comes to fighting. Amen. Anybody ever had a bad pair of shoes and you gave them the goodwill? Because you understood that I can't walk around in shoes that hurt my feet because I need my feet to feel good if I'm going to be able to do the things God has called me to do. Amen. They designed those shoes for battle that it might not come loose and that they would have good footing on their way to the battle. And now sometimes you need a good running shoe. How many know you need a good running shoe in this spiritual walk? If you don't believe me, ask Joseph. Joseph had to run when Miss Potiphar made passes at him. Yeah, you need a good running shoe every now and then. Sometimes we need to run from temptation. David ran from Saul. Ain't nothing wrong with running when you know it's the best thing to do. Ain't no sense in you standing before temptation, acting like you all holy, knowing that your flesh is too strong. You might as well get on your running shoes and leave the peace of God behind. But you take your peaceful self and get out of that situation. I wish I had somebody shout hallelujah. How many know that you need peace in order to get through this battle? The peace that's, that surpasseth all understanding. Anybody know what that's like? You're in the midst of a battle, and you don't know how you're going to get through this storm, but somehow in, through it all, you're sitting there, you've been crying, but you're not hysterical. I mean, you wonder how tomorrow is going to turn out, but you know he holds your tomorrow. And people wondering how it is that you're sitting there, and you're holding on to your peace. It's because you got peace that surpasses all understanding. Next time you tell them, girl, when I got up this morning, not only did I put on the belt of truth, and not only did I put on the breastplate of righteousness, but I put on the shoes of peace. And I don't care what hell comes my way, I'm going to be able to walk through it with the peace of God in my life. I know somebody today has had to walk through situations and you needed the peace of God to sustain you. I'm reminded of a story that I heard with two painters. They were asked to draw a painting to depict peace. Whichever painter would draw the best picture would get $250,000. Well, the first painter went to the canvas and he created a serene portrait of a lake with the sun glistening off of it at the right angle. So much so that it sparkled across the waters and then he painted a shepherd walking with sheep and the sheep stopped and they drank from the stillness of the lake and the trees stood off at a distance with birds gathered at their tallest tallest limbs and everybody went oh that is so peaceful and he sat back with a sigh of relief well the second painter rushed to the canvas he immediately painted a pitch black dark sky. Lightning shot through the sky in zigzag movements. And, and this painting also had water, but this water was raging water and angry water. Amen. As if the, the water had been awakened from a terrible dream. His trees were bent and bowed in the storm and looked like they were at their breaking point. Strong winds were blowing. The, 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 the portrait looked so chaotic. And then way down in the right corner of this chaos, just 
on the border of a storm was a bird standing on a rock. But not only was the bird standing on a rock, he had his head back singing in the midst of a storm. And when they saw the bird singing in the midst of a storm, his eye is on the spell. And I know he watches over me. When the second painter got through, he won the prize. And they said, because this bird was singing and had peace in the midst of the storm. Have you got peace when the winds, the winds and the waves are blowing in your life? Can you say, my soul is anchored? I wish I had somebody to know what it's like to have to sing a song in a strange land. Sing a song when you're going through, but somehow you got peace like a river. I wish I had somebody that's had peace in the midst of your storm. A little boy was flying on an airplane one night, and the plane ran into a storm. The turbulence was causing all the other passengers to have a period of panic. And one of the passengers sitting next to the boy looked at him and saw how calm he was. And he was humming while the plane was going and dipping back and forth. And the man said, little boy, why aren't you afraid like the rest of us? The little boy said, well, because my father is the pilot. And when you know who's driving in your storm, you don't get too excited about how bad it gets. Because your daddy knows how to get through a storm. Anybody know that God will get you through a storm? If you just hang in there and begin to have peace like a river that passes my way. Oh, I wish I had somebody that understands that peace will get you through anything. Put on your belt of truth. Put on your best plate of righteousness and then walk around with the peace of God and you will be able to defeat the enemy who's trying to steal your joy. Peace, righteousness, and truth. Come on, stand up in this place, everybody. Peace, righteousness, and truth. The trilogy of that which you wear. The first mention of Paul's armor. Next time we're together, I'll share with you the rest of the apparatus. But don't leave home. Don't, don't be guilty of spiritual sagging. Put on the belt of truth. Would you bow your heads with me, Lord? Thank you. So many of us don't know the naked truth. And that is we get up too often without getting dressed in your armor. I pray that in the morning when our feet hit the floor, we'll remember the admonition from pastor that says, wait a minute. Let me put on a belt of truth. You woke me up this morning, started me on my way. It was not my alarm clock. It was your mercy and grace that kept me. And I'm putting on the breastplate of righteousness. No matter what people say to me today or what happens to me today, I'm going to walk like God. I'm going to talk like God. I'm going to love like God. I'm going to forgive like God. Lord, I'm going to stand now. Let the peace surround my feet. I don't know what I'm facing the rest of this day, but I'm walking in your peace. You take me through. And Father, in order for us to have 
the opportunity to be dressed in your spiritual apparatus. We need to know you personally. Church membership is fine, but we need a relationship with he that can change our dirty clothes, that can snatch us from the fire, blow the fire off of us, and clean us up. Oh, Father, I pray at the close of this prayer that if there's anyone here today that need a relationship with you, because when they have a relationship with you, you can clean up every virus that is trying to take them out. Oh God, there may be someone here today that, that loves you and have a relationship with you and they just need a spiritual home where they can continue to grow. I'm praying you'll touch their hearts and if it be your will, they come forward. Now I'm asking, Help us to get dressed every day. Don't let us get halfway down in the day and take off our shoes or loosen our belt. <laughs> Help us to stay dressed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask you to come. You're here today and God.